City Church, maybe be the first one to say Merry Christmas to you in this Christmas season. We welcome you. If you are joining us online, we welcome you into our house. Would you do this, this favor? Would you like this post? Would you share it so your friends can hear the message and even comment and let us know that you are here? Believe it or not, uh, if you're watching, you just join us, you may not know that our furnace broke. And so it is about 48 degrees in the house this morning, but there is a good group of people, and I just want to give it up for the good group of people who showed up in spite of the cold. I'm going to call them my frozen chosen this morning. They are socially distanced uh, when it comes to people they came with, but if you came with somebody, it looks like you are snuggling up, and, uh, and I can understand that proposition. So, Thank you. If you stayed at home, that's what we wanted you to do for your comfort. But if you came, it makes my job so much easier. And let me tell you, wasn't that worship dynamic this morning? I want to just give God praise. And I want to let you know that warmed me up. I'm feeling awfully good. I think I'm, that was a, I don't know if that, those particular vocalists ever sang together before. I don't know if the three of you ever, I'm going to call you all the Spice Girls. Y'all spiced it up. Right? They spiced it up this morning, and we give God praise. And I just want to thank God for all of our volunteers that make every single experience special, those who are on the tech team, those controlling the slide and the screen and the music, and those who came in this week to clean and to decorate. It just feels so good to be in this place with these Christmas decorations. And we start our new Christmas series entitled God with Us, Jesus, at the center of it all. Where would we begin the Christmas story. Some would turn to the book of Matthew. Some would turn and recite what Linus recited or Charlie Brown recited there in Luke chapter 2. But I will introduce to you the thought of Christmas starts all the way in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the Hebrew Bible. And it's there that the prophesied Messiah would come. Now, uh, this is a church where we're reaching people right where they are, and this may be their first opportunity to visit church. And if you're a guest this morning or you're joining us online, we want to welcome you. We thank you. Can we show them our appreciation for being in the house and joining online? We don't want to take it for granted that you understand what we mean when we say these biblical words. Messiah, it means the anointed one, or if you could use this phraseology, the chosen one. It has the sense of a deliverer or, as we would say so often, a savior. And when we turn from the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, and we come into the New Testament, we read in the Gospels. The Gospels are the eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus. We, we, we read that when this Messiah was born, many people actually missed it. Or they didn't believe it. They didn't believe him to be the one. Why would they miss the Messiah when he came? I believe because they were looking for a conquering king, not a poor carpenter's kid. They missed it so bad that they actually executed this miracle worker and teacher. And they nailed him to a cross because he claimed that God as his father, which was blasphemy. And they figured Killing him would put an end to this disruption to their religious system. How did that work for them? It didn't stop it at all, did it? In fact, all over the world right now, some billion people take this time of year to celebrate the birth of Jesus. How did that happen? I believe it's because the Gospels record that three days after they nailed him to the cross and killed him, that he rose from the dead. And the people who believed it, believed in his resurrection, were so radically moved by this event that they began to share the news with everyone they could, even if it threatened their life. One of the religious elitists who didn't believe primarily or at first in the resurrection, he was so zealous and blinded to who the true Messiah was that he actually made it his life's mission to imprison and persecute and even execute these converts 
who were first known as those who follow the way of Jesus. Later on, those people who were known as the people of the way, they would be uh, named, nicknamed by their persecutors. And it, it was something like this, you, you junior Jesus, right? You little, you little Christ. Well, we've come to know that as the word Christian. And it was Saul of Tarsus, or Paul, which would be the Greek pronunciation of the name Saul. He was a Christian killer. Maybe you've heard what happened to that guy, the Christian killer, Paul or Saul. Here's what happened, if you haven't heard. He's on the road heading to a city called Damascus. He's literally got letters on his person which gave him the, uh, the authority to murder these disciples of Jesus with immunity. And when he's on this road, all of a sudden, he sees a bright light. He falls to the ground, and he hears a voice from heaven. He wasn't by himself, by the way. There are other people who could validate and verify this account. He hears this voice from heaven, and in response to hearing this voice, he asks the, the two most important questions of life. The most important questions of life, and I believe the most important questions of spirituality. What did Paul or Saul say that day when he heard from heaven? Acts 9, 5, and 6 records it. It says, and he said, who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So trembling and astonished, he said, Lord, what would you have me to do? I've underlined that for you. It's not underlined in the Bible. It's on the slide there for you because I believe those are the two most important questions of life. Who are you, Lord? And Lord, what would you have me, or what do you want me to do? Those two questions not only are worthy of pursuing answers for, but they're also worthy of giving your life to. Who are you, Lord? Now, every time you see the word Lord in the Bible, it doesn't always mean divinity or God, but here I believe it does. I believe he is saying, who are you, God? Reveal yourself to me. It's in his response, why? To a supernatural event that he asked the question. And then it leads to a supernatural transformation when the answer is given. Who are you, Lord? I hear this, this voice. I see this light. This must be God. God, reveal yourself to me. And then what does God say? Who does God reveal himself to be? He says, I'm Jesus. Come on, does anybody got a praise this morning? That Jesus is Lord. Jesus is, is God. I'm Jesus. Now, this was astonishing. Can we go back to Acts uh, 5 and 6? Notice he said he trembled and he was astonished. Why? Because Jesus says, I'm the one you're trying to destroy. I'm the one you're persecuting. I, I love the language of Jesus there. He says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Paul wasn't actually persecuting Jesus. He was persecuting Jesus' people. Notice that Jesus steps up and he stands beside. Notice he takes on the identity and he takes the presence of his people when they're under persecution. I want you to know today, if you feel like you're being persecuted, Jesus is standing there right next to you. You persecute them, you got to persecute me too. I'm Jesus who you are persecuting. Paul's astonished. And in his astonishment, he asked this question, Lord, what do you want me to do? My friend, Pastor Doug Wampler, he says this, the most dangerous thing you and I could ever know is what we're supposed to do. Because once we know it, you can't unknow it. Right? And you'll either be obedient or you'll be a rebel, but you'll never be left with an excuse. So Paul now knows, and he can't unknow. So what does he choose to do? Verse number 20, it says, and immediately he preached Christ in the synagogues. What was his message? 
It's the same message that we have this morning, that he is the son of God. Did you see that? This was the very message that Paul was having Christians killed for. Now he's preaching it himself. What a turnaround. I don't, I don't care who you are this morning, what you're going through, how far you may feel from God, you are never too far from God's grace. You have never gone too far that God's arms can't reach you. So over the course of a few years, Paul goes from throwing people into prison for being a Christian to being a Christian who's thrown into prison himself for preaching Jesus. Making disciples for Jesus and starting churches with those disciples. And if we come to a book that isn't always highlighted in Christmas, not Matthew, not Luke, but the book of Colossians. We come to the book of Colossians, we're going to find that this is Paul writing a letter, and he's actually writing it from prison. He's writing a letter to the church at a town called Colossae. These are a group of disciples that Paul actually had not discipled himself. Now, that's interesting. Someone he discipled went out to this city and began to disciple other people. Now, this is not the message, but I need you to know that is my personal goal, and that is the mission of this church, to make disciples who make disciples. My mission is not to fill up this room with people who listen to me, but my mission is to fill up people with the knowledge of Jesus who will go out and fill up other people with what they've received of Jesus. So Paul's talking to his spiritual grandchildren right now. He's writing this letter to this church at the request of their pastor, a man whose name is Epaphras. He's a fellow laborer with Paul. We think that Epaphras traveled hundreds of miles to be with Paul and to receive this word from him because there was something very serious he had to tell his people. And before you start scrolling and looking at something else, before you check out, and I know it's difficult this morning to keep your focus, I want you to know that God has a very important word for you, just like he did for the church at Colossae. In the book of Colossians, for the sake of time, let me just highlight what happens. He starts with a greeting in verse number 1 and 2. He encourages them in verse number 3 through 8. He shares his prayer for them in verses 9 through 14 of chapter number 1. And then he gets to verse number 15. If you have a physical copy, it would be worth you turning to the pages. If you have a cell phone with the version app, turn on the app and come to Colossians 1, verse number 15. He's coming now to the subject of the letter. He's passed his prelude. He's passed the introductions and the formalities. And he says, this is what I really want to talk about. And I want you to understand that understanding this subject is the key to understanding the whole letter. And if I may add this, and this is a bold statement, but I believe I can back it up this morning. I believe what he's going to reveal in the next five verses is the key to all things spiritual. Did you hear me? I'm not saying this is mystical. I'm not saying this is a secret. I'm actually saying it's very open. It's right there. You can open it up, look at it in your lap for yourself. The key to all things spiritual, I believe Paul is getting ready to address. Now, I need you to understand the occasion for him giving this subject. It's a response to the pressures that were threatening the church. And when I say the church, I don't mean four walls and a pulpit and an organ. The church is what? Us, the people. Remember the little thing? Here's the church, here's the steeple, here's, you know, here's the, open it up, there's the people. Now, the church is the people. So there's a pressure that these people are under that is threatening them. Pressures from the culture, pressures from the surrounding community, pressures from family members who didn't understand their conversion, pressures in opposition to this belief system that these disciples have now given their life for. I'm in constant awe of the relevance of the Bible. Constant awe that this ancient book, this letter that is some 2,000 years old, speaks about the same pressures and threats to the church and to his people. It answers the same questions. It gives the same answers that Paul addressed 
And if not, similarly, but the very same, the very same things that we see happening before our very eyes today in 2020. A threat to the church or to God's people had to be addressed. A threat to the church, the theological term, we call it as heresy. You ever heard that phrase before, heresy? Or heretic? This is someone who's coming in and they're teaching falsehoods. They're telling lies. Would you be interested to know what the lie that was being told in this church? Would you like to know the false teaching that was permeating the culture? I believe it can be st- described as a twofold lie that had four parts. Don't get confused. It's simple, I promise. Twofold lie that had four parts. Basically, is it okay if I teach this morning? Basically, it was a mixture between paganism and Judaism. Now, paganism is a uh, false philosophies and worship of many deities. So if we line up a bunch of idols here on the front altar and we start and we start bowing down to these multiple different idols, that's paganism. It's a it's also a false philosophy of of who who these gods or these deities are and where they live and what their intent for the world is. That's paganism. But Judaism on, the, Judaism, on the contrast, comes from the ancient Hebrew Bible, and it's a monotheistic religion, meaning they believe in only one God, but yet what they do, they have a false interpretation of the Old Testament, which leads to legalism and ceremonialism. What's those words mean? Legalism is believing that obeying and keeping the law, or the attempt to keep the law, is going to be your basis of salvation. I say it this way, it's people who are trying to work their way to heaven. I, I meet people like this all the time. You ask them, are you going to go to heaven when you die? And they say, I hope so. And then I'm saying, what are you basing that hope off of? Well, I'm hoping my good works outweigh my bad works. And I, I'm just saying, that just, that just doesn't work. It doesn't work. First of all, it doesn't work. Because I think you're being very generous with how many good works you had compared to bad works. I mean, let's be real this morning. And I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me. I think you're being very generous. But even the most moral of us, so let's put Mother Teresa up on the the scale. Even the most moral of us, the proper interpretation of that scale would not be your good works versus your bad works. It would be you on one side of the scale, and it would be Jesus on the other side of the scale. Now, is there anybody in the world that wants to say, I'll measure up with Jesus? And so these people are reading the Old Testament and believing that they can measure up with Yahweh. They think they can measure up with the great Jehovah, the great I am. And then a part of that is that they take this strict letter for letter, tick for tack interpretation of the ceremonies that God gives, and they they make it into some type of dead religion. Anybody grown up in something like this before? Now, that's the twofold part of paganism and, and Judaism mixed together, but there are four parts to this lie. We're going to understand the, the, the craftiness of our enemy this morning. Look at this four-part um, lie. You ready? It's bold. Number one, if you're taking notes. And if you're not taking notes, take some notes. Here's the lie. Number one, they didn't believe that Jesus came in the flesh. Okay, this goes back to that paganistic philosophy. It was the idea that spirit is good and matter or material is bad. Okay, you with me now? This ideology, these ideologies are still in the world today. Have you ever seen people who will literally like whip themselves? It's like it's a sadistic form of my body is bad, so I'm going to, I'm going to hurt myself to try to take myself to some kind of spiritual level. It's, it's a form of saying spirit is good and matter is bad. Now, here's where that gets really dangerous 
is because they say, well, if God is spirit and God is good, then he could not have created matter. It's the, 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 the phrase is dualism. Number two, so not only do they believe that Jesus didn't come in the flesh, matter, right? Because matter's bad. But they believe that Jesus was not God. Why? Well, they believe that from God came these um, emanations. And it, it would be like the equivalent of like spirits or even angels. Many of them were angel worshipers. And they would say, so God is the spirit that is totally good. And obviously he couldn't create the universe because the universe is matter and the matter is bad. So there must have been these emanations that, uh, uh, um, that come out from God, and there's like several of them, and they start like in a hierarchy. So the ones that's closest to God would be the most good, and the ones that are furthest from God are the most bad. And it must have been one of those really far ones from God that created the universe. And so they would think that Jesus was one of those superior angels, one of those superior spirits. This is a, this is a lie, isn't it? <laughs> Third part of this lie. They believed that the message that Paul preached, what, was the, what do we call the message that Paul preached? The gospel. They believed the gospel was too, too simplistic. Now, now, you have to understand. Now, some of you think, man, you've used a lot of words. What are you talking about simple? This is not our culture. We are, we are a simple culture. We have simple language. I, I know some of these things, you may feel like they're deep. Honestly, they're simplistic. A child could understand this properly discipled. The Greek culture that, we're, that Paul is speaking to, they, they love knowledge. They love ority or, or, or oral um, giving of people who could stand and give a speech. You want to you know how deep they were? They thought Paul was ignorant. So read the New Testament, the 13 letters that he wrote, and they're like, that's ignorant. They, they love Aristotle and, and Socrates. They, they love these deep philosophers. And so when Paul comes into town, matter of fact, Paul says, I didn't even play into their game. I did not come with, with some type of oral demonstration. I come with the power of the Spirit. I come with, with, with the demonstration of power. It wasn't about the words that I said. It was about the Spirit of God that was in me that gave power and life to this good news, this gospel. They, weren't, they, didn't want, they wanted to hear the word. They wanted to be flattered. They wanted to, be, they wanted to feel like they're learning something new. They wanted a higher knowledge, something that was mystical and secret, only attained by a few. Later on in the second century, this would be called Gnosticism. There's a form of this still in the world today. Anytime you hear, see somebody write a book and say, here's a new revelation, or this is something new, or here's something that you've never heard before, that's all a tarp of only the select and only if you can get this wisdom and this knowledge because it's been a secret. But the gospel is simple. Fourthly, and, and finally to this lie, there was this detachment to the material and a focus on keeping the ceremonial law. What were the ceremonial laws? Well, a lot of them were about like dietary, dietary laws. So remember the Jewish people, there were a lot of things they didn't eat. Primarily, you, you know it, Jewish people and Islamic people, don't, they don't eat pork. They don't eat um, pig. And there's other things that God said to those people. It was a dietary thing. I believe it was a hygiene thing. It was a way that God was preserving his people from getting disease and sickness. They didn't eat pork. But then... God has this, this dream, this vision he gives to Peter where there's all these different types of animals, clean and unclean, pigs and, and cows. And God says, Peter, go ahead and eat all of them. And Peter was so like into this thing himself. He's like, I've never eaten anything unclean. God, what are you talking about? And God says, how are you going to call something unclean that I've said is clean? So God is saying here, it wasn't about the ceremonies. It was about everything it was pointing to, which is Christ. But they got caught up on the ceremonies. So they were big into still eating the things and wearing the things. And you'll see people like this even today. Literally wear tassels on their clothing. Literally won't shave their beards. Won't wear fabrics that are mixed. I mean, there's so many of those laws. They were made for specific time for specific people, which were the Jews. And it was under the law. And all of it was the point to Jesus. But they're still caught up in all that ceremony. They still caught up on the Sabbaths and the festivals and all this and that. And what was most difficult for the audience that Paul was speak, preaching to was the ceremonial rite of circumcision. 
I'm, we're talking about having surgery <laughs> for the dudes. And they're like, wait a minute, I got to do that to be a Christian? And so they have this big council, this big conference. Hey, we need to figure this out. Do we have to have surgery to become a Christian? And you know what the early church says? No. You, you don't force this. Don't put this yoke or this burden of bondage on these people. We couldn't even keep it ourselves is what they say. Don't put it on them. Basically tell them, keep following Jesus and try to stay out of trouble. That's what they basically, I know that's the KKV, the Kirk Kirkland version. But that's basically what they say. All those dietary laws, all the laws of circumcision, all of that, they say, no, it's fulfilled in Christ. And if you're in Christ, then you are in circumcision. If you're in Christ, you're in Abraham. I'm preaching and teaching better than you responding. So you need to take some notes so you can say amen this afternoon when you read over your notes. This was a group of people called the Essenes. So see this fourfold lie. Jesus didn't come in the flesh. Jesus was not the God, Elohim. The gospel's too simple. It needs to be mysterious. And that we should detach from the world and focus on ceremonial, dietary, and festival laws. And what Paul writes in Colossians, if I could skip to verse 23, I want you to get the gist, and then I'm going to preach if I have time this morning. I may skip to the end. Here's basically what he's trying to say about people believing and receiving these lies. He says, if indeed you continue in the faith, can you help me? Would you like say the words that are underlined with me? You don't have to say the whole thing, but the, the, what is underlined, can you read with me? And then when I get to the underlined part, say it with me. You ready? Let's start over. If indeed you in the faith, grounded and, and are not moved away from the hope of the which you heard, which is preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. He's saying here, I don't want you to be moved by all this stuff. I don't want you to fall prey to this stuff. Don't, don't be changed. Don't be swayed. Continue. That means keep going in the same direction you were going. Everybody with me? Be grounded. If I'm grounded here, I, I got my feet underneath me, you can't knock me down with some false teaching. I'm steadfast. That word fast, it's like the word fastener. I'm fastened down. I'm batting down the hatches. No matter what kind of lies and storms come, I'm standing right here where I was when I got what? The gospel. The good news. I'm not moving. And here's what you need to know. And you may be a young Christian this morning. You're like, what in the world is this message all about? I want you to know that these lies and these philosophies are still around. And we are living in an age where people are rejecting the truth. They're rejecting. You know what? You want me to prove it to you? Go out to your job and start saying openly and honestly to people, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I believe the Bible. I believe in Jesus. Look at all the funny looks you're going to get. Look at the persecution or the laughter, the snickering, or even literally people who maneuver against you. Because you say you believe the Bible, you believe in Jesus. He's saying here that you have to be prepared and ready. This is not old. This is not ancient. This is not something that got fixed. But we should still, as in verse number five, we should be grounded to the word of the truth, which is the gospel. I mean, we're in 2020 today. Let me ask you this question. What is truth? What is truth in 2020? Is there even such a thing in the mind of the prevalent? Society, you know what is prevalent today, the ideology that is prevalent today? That everyone has their own truth. They even use that language. That's your truth. This is my truth. Now, that's a problem, especially when your truth is stepping all over my truth. The question is, what is truth? When, when you got your truth and I got my truth, you know what that means? That means everybody's doing right in their own eyes. And here's what, when you say you have truth and you make exclusive claims, when you say that this is the only way, they'll, they'll call you bigoted, oppressive, backward. And that's why it's not popular to say that you're a Christian today. Because what you're saying is, I believe in a set of truths, and that truth comes from Jesus. And some people are like, I don't get down with Jesus. I don't get down with the Bible. And there is this, still this philosophies and these lies and false teaching that come. 
And the question is, if it's not you, and I know there's some people in church, it's you. It's you. <laughs> you could have grew up in church. Just be honest with yourself. It's you. You don't believe it. You, you haven't received it yet. You're in the right place. You're on the right journey. But be honest enough to say you don't totally accept it all. And then there's people who are watching by way of internet. There'll be people who will comment. There'll be people who will leave a review. There'll be people who will snicker, who will laugh, who will oppress, who will, who will make documentaries against this whole stuff. Mm -hmm. And the question is, what can we believe for truth? What can we believe as truth? There was a really famous pastor who lived in uh, the 19th century. His name was Charles Hatton Spurgeon. He gave an illustration of two men in a boat. He said, there's these two men in the boat, and they're heading down the river, and it's getting faster and faster because they're heading towards a waterfall. And he says, as they begin to panic, that some men on the shore throw out a rope, and then the men have a choice. They look at the rope, and they see floating down the river next to them is a large log. One of the men grabs the rope. One of the men sees the large log and grabs the log. Well, the man who grabs the rope is pulled ashore and he's safe. The man who grabbed the log, though it was close and though it was large and though it felt secure, kept floating down and went over that waterfall. And Spurgeon uses this as an illustration. The log is like false teaching. It looks good. It feels good. But what's the problem? It isn't grounded. The rope, it may not be as big. You may not be able to get your whole body on it. You may just have to hold on the best you can. But the rope is connected to something that is fixed. The rope will bring you from the place where you are and it will bring you to somewhere you need to be. I believe that people are rejecting the rope of the gospel, and they're jumping for a log of false religion. Why? Why would you? I know you hear that illustration. You're like, oh, they're stupid. No, people do it all the time. Why would they, why would they do this? I think because people are blinded by false religion. They just can't see out of it. You, you think of them, those, those people, and you love them. I'm not criticizing. I'm not judging. But you can't tell them anything, can you? You can, be on, you can be on Facebook for three hours arguing with them. They're not going to change. They're not going to change. Why? Because they're blinded. Only God can remove the scales from their eyes where they can see. Some of them aren't blinded. Some of them are bewildered by spiritual things. What does bewildered mean? They just they don't get it. They can't understand it. A lot of those people end up agnostic, atheist, or skeptical. They, like, when you start talking about supernatural stuff, they're like, I, I can't believe that and receive that. But what they're doing is they're making a choice what to place their faith in. They're making a choice. Because there's answers that they don't have, and some of the people that they ascribe to that they believe are very smart, they don't have answers either. We have actually a commonality in many things, but yet they just, they're bewildered by spirit. When you start talking spiritual, they're like, oh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't get that. And then not only are there people who are blinded and bewildered, but then there are people, and I think this is the largest growing sect of people in our country, who are burdened by the choice. What does that mean? They're burdened by having, having to pursue knowledge and choose. And they're like, I don't want to choose. I don't want to think. I, I don't want to pursue. I just want to go make some money. I, I just want to go have fine pleasure. I just want to be happy. And I don't care what you, I don't care about what they believe. I don't care what he believes, she believes, Muslim, Islam, boot. I, and you know what they call themselves, that group? Nuns. And I'm not talking about the ladies who slap you with the rulers, okay, growing up. Different kind of nuns. N-O-N-E. None. Meaning nothing. They're not atheists. They're not agnostic. They're just nothing. I don't want to choose. I don't want to pick. And I don't want to pursue the knowledge, because that takes time, doesn't it? That, 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 takes, that, that takes a diligent life to say, I'm going to search after and try to find out what is truth. And that's why they jump on the log. 
and not the rope. And you know what? Can I tell you something? I know I'm running out of time, and so like, I really need to just like, phew, I may have to save this for, for next week. I think some Christians aren't doing themselves any favors. Come on, let's be honest with ourselves. To be honest, how many of the people who are listening to this message really know what they believe and why they believe it? Or how many of us think that's the pastor's job to figure that out and just tell me? And how many people, when you get encountered with someone who has a different religion, false teaching, you don't know what to say, and you're like, well, my pastor said, well, let me ask my pastor. Well, let me go ask somebody else. Well, let me, and you know, there's nothing wrong with being honest with yourself because, listen, <laughs> I didn't get to where I'm at, you know, overnight. But there's, not, there's nothing wrong with being honest with yourself saying, I got some room to grow. But where the problem is when you choose to stay stagnant, when you choose to say, I'm just going to subcontract that, I'm going to put a little something to the plate, and I'm going to let him take care of it. The Bible says that we all should have an answer for the hope that's within us. And so if that means, I get, you know what, pastor's talking about this growth track. I need to get on this growth track. I need to learn. I need to know what I believe and why I believe it. If, listen, I, I would say be careful, but you can get on YouTube and get discipled, follow good, sound Bible teaching on YouTube. You've got to be careful because you're going to find those false teaching all over YouTube. This is, what, this is why discipleship is so important. That's why you can't do life alone. You've got to walk with someone who can walk and show you and discern Scripture with you. And so Christians aren't doing themselves any favors because we neglect to study the Word, and we end up allowing things to creep into our spirits and creep into our churches. And guess what? Some of it is blatant paganism. That same, when I was talking about all the gods, the false gods lining up here on the front, paganism, that stuff crept into the church. Newsflash, okay, because I need to say this. There are elements of the holiday season that we are celebrating that have paganism mixed in there. It's truth. It's truth. Now, we don't worship the pagans. I'm not bound down to that tree. What we do is we redeem and we point to the truth. I'm not worshiping the tree, but I'm remembering there was a tree one day that somebody cut down and they made it into a cross that Jesus died on. And so that tree represents the cross that Jesus was going to die on. I don't worship the stars, but I remember there was a star that led to a little baby that was in Bethlehem. And that baby is the savior of the world. I don't know if he was born on December the 25th, but we don't know when he was born. So December 25th is just as good a day of any to celebrate the coming of Jesus. But if you don't know what you don't know, somebody will come up and say, did you know Saturnella? Did you know? Did you know? And you're like, I didn't know. And remember this, once you know, the most dangerous thing to do is to know, because then you can't unknow it. Then you got to do something about it. And so we got to know what we believe and why we believe it. But back to the answer. I'm going to read it. I'm going to highlight it. And we're going to close up this morning. Here's the answers to every false lie about Jesus. It's found in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. Let's read it. He is, anytime you see the pronoun, he, it is talking about Jesus or the Father. You ready? He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation, for by him, Jesus, right? Remember that? Pronouns of Jesus or, or the Father. For by him, Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him. Who's the him? And for him. Who's the him? Jesus. Next verse. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. 
verses 19 and 20. For it pleased the Father that in him, Jesus, all the fullness should dwell. And by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Now, if I had another hour, I'd give you the rest of my sermon. So how about we make a deal and we show up next week and I'll just go word for word, word for word, write down Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. But here's something most people don't know about this passage of Scripture. There are very many people who think this is not just some beautiful words that Paul wrote, but it was actually an ancient hymn. It was an ancient song that the early church would sing. This is Christmas time, isn't it? This is the time when we sing hymns. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come, ye, oh, come, ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the king of angels. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. This was a possibly a hymn that they would sing just like we just sang. That would turn their eyes, turn their view to the image of the invisible God. Someone said it this way, alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity and grace unknown and love beyond degree. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do at the cross. At the cross is where I first saw the light. And the burden of my heart rolled away. And it was there by faith I received my sight. And now I'm happy all the day. Come on, is there anybody got a praise in your lips? For the revelation of who God is. I'm not talking to you about what kind of religion you got. I'm telling you, who is Jesus? And that is the secret. That is the answer to all of life's mysteries and questions and spiritual realities. Who is Jesus? Can I tell you who he is? If there were words for him, then I don't have them. You see, my brain has not reached the point where I could form a thought that would adequately describe the greatness of my God and my lungs. My lungs have not developed the ability to release a breath with enough agility that could breathe out the greatness of his love. And my voice, you see, my voice is so inhibited, restrained by human limits that it's hard to even see the praise up. You see, if there were words for him, then I don't have them. My God, his grace is is remarkable. His mercies are innumerable. His strength is impenetrable. He's honorable, accountable, favorable. He's unsearchable, yet knowable, indefinable, yet approachable, indescribable, yet personal. He is beyond comprehension, further than imagination, constant through the generations, king of every nation's. But if there are words for him, then I don't have them. You see, my words are few. And trying to capture the one true God using my vocabulary would never do. But if I use words as an expression, an expression of worship to a Savior, a Savior who is both worthy and deserving of my praise, So I use words. My heart 
extols the Lord and blesses his name forever. He has won my heart, captured my mind, and has bound them both together. He has defeated me in my rebellion, conquered me in my sin. He has welcomed me into his presence, completely invited me in. He has made himself the object of my sight, flooding me with mercies in the morning, drowning me with grace in the night. But if there are words for him, then I don't have them. But I do, what I do have is good news. For God knew that man-made words would never do. The words are just tools that we use to point to the truth. So he sent his son Jesus as the word living proof. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, giving nothingness formation. And by his word he sustains in the power of his name. For he is before all things, and over all things he reigns. Holy is his name. So praise him for his life and the way he preserved in strife the humble son of God, becoming the perfect sacrifice. Praise him for his death, that he willingly stood in our place, that he lovingly endured the grave, that he battled our enemy, and then he rose from the grave in victory. In victory. And he is everything that was promised. Praise him as the risen king. Lift up your voice and sing, for one day he will return for us, and finally we'll be united with our Savior for eternity eternity. So it's not just words that I proclaim, for my words point to the word, and the word has a name. Hope has a name. Joy has a name. Peace has a name. Love has a name. And that name is Jesus. That name is Jesus. Come on, help me, church. That name is Jesus. And what we were created for and by him was to praise that name. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed.